Jesus Savior is different than Jesus Lord. Jesus Savior is the entryway in to making Jesus Lord. When Jesus is your Savior, you believe that he was raised from the dead. And you, confess, you believe that in your, in your heart and you confess that with your mouth. The Bible says you'll be born again. You've taken him as Savior. But on the earth, in order to get the highest and the best that God has for you, you have to make him Lord. Lord means master. Uh, when Jesus is your Savior, it affects you spiritually. It'll affect maybe a day of your life, maybe Sunday. But when Jesus is Lord, it affects your whole life. It affects your Monday. It affects who you are at work. It affects how, what, how what you talk about. It affects how everything going on in the world affects you. So everybody shout again, Jesus is Lord. And so I want you to turn to the place where, just, you know, um, all the Gospels cover this, but I want to look at Matthew's account. So let's look at Matthew chapter 26. So you all know what we celebrate, Resurrection Day. We know that Jesus, the Son of God, had to prepare himself to go to the cross. He prepared himself for the whipping post. He knew what was about to happen. He, he knew what Isaiah prophesied about him. He knew that he was going to become sin. He knew that he was going to be separated from the Father. He knew that he was going to take on every sickness, every disease. He was going to take it upon his body. He can read where they were going to mar him beyond human recognition. He knew what was coming. Now we know Jesus is the Son of God, the only begotten. And yet on earth, he is all God and all man. He chose to lay aside his deity. And so we see him as Savior and we make him the Lord of our life, but also he's our example. Aren't you glad for a good example? He's our example, uh, like even when he went into the wilderness. He's our example how to deal with the devil. How did he deal with the devil? It is written. How many know you can't say it is written if you don't know what's written? Well, I heard Pastor Mark say, that's not good enough. You have to know what is written in order to get rid of the devil. But you see that Jesus is my example. And so that's really what Lord means. He's also my example. I strive to be like him. Remember we said we are to be imitators of God. Jesus laid down an example for us that we should follow in his footsteps. Well, here he is in the garden. And what I want to talk to you about is this, um, when he said this. So let's look at Matthew 26. We'll start at verse 39 just, for, uh, just to pick it up. Remember, uh, Peter, uh, James, and John are there with him. Um, and his soul was, begins to be sorrowful. And he asked them to watch in verse 39. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father. If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But if there is no other way, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And then he went out and said, watch and pray. Uh, well, he came back and he saw the disciples, they were asleep. He said, couldn't you watch with me for an hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Verse 42, and he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, your will be done. Everybody say, not my will, but your will be done. So we're going to talk about will. Now listen, uh, I want you to take this for yourself, but I want you to also understand that God created man with a will. We are a three-part being. You are a spirit. You have a soul. In your soul, there's three parts. You have a mind, you have a will, and you have emotions. And then you live in a body. Now, when you get born again, your spirit is alive unto God. It's perfect. It never needs healed. Um, it, it, it does need fed. <laughs> it needs train, you know, it needs fed. It needs lifted up. But you don't need to get your spirit healed. I've heard people say, well, my spirit's wounded. Your spirit's not wounded. You're created in the likeness and the image of God. Your spirit is not wounded. If you've been taught that in charismania, you need to toss that aside. But I can tell you where you do get wounded. <laughs> is in your emotions. 
Jesus said he came to heal the brokenhearted. So our souls, man, they can be a mess. Have you ever seen a dinged up car? You know, you see someone driving around and their car's like got the fender, uh, you know, it been in, they, they're missing a, a, a thing, um, you know, like a, um, you know, a, a mirror on the side, maybe the door handle is off. What do we know about them? You have been through some stuff. Right? And that's kind of how we are in life. But how you know Jesus is the mender of the brokenhearted. So your soul can get wounded. Now, in your soul, in your mind, uh, with the, the, the thinking part of you, there's also this will. And the will is the decision-making part of you. And the thing that God did when he created mankind, he created us, three parts being, in the likeness and the image of God. But he also gave us the ability to make decisions. He gave us, because he didn't want us to be robots, he wanted us to be children. Now, how many of you ever wish, don't raise your hand, and you know, uh, y'all, how many ever wish your children couldn't make decisions? They could, they would just do what you say. But that doesn't work that way, right? From the time that they're little, they're making decisions based on the information you gave them and the penalty they're willing to endure, And the penalty they're willing to endure. And so man was created with the will. This is important. So you say, well, Jesus is the son of God. What, what, What are you saying? I'm saying the Bible says if he wanted to, he could have called 10,000 angels. One of those angels could have wiped them all out. But he could have called multitudes of them and there would be no more earth. He said, he, he said, no man took my life. I willingly laid it down. He knew what his body was fashioned for to be the Lamb of God. Jesus himself had a will. And what you need to understand is the will, the decision-making part of you, is very, um, it just depends on what's put into it. What decisions you make. Jesus knew. He sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. He was, he was, he was tormented to the fact of, of heaviness. This is Jesus. But he knew what he was going to do. But he decided. But he decided. Even in the temptation, the devil offered him an easy way out. The devil said, if you'll worship me then I'll give this to you. If you want to, in other words, if you want to miss the nastiness of the cross, if you want to miss, I, you know, I, I don't know if the devil knew all that was going to happen because the Bible says if he would have known, he would never crucify the Lord of glory. But he was trying to give a real temptation, Jesus, another way. And Jesus had to say, uh-uh. His will his will, it could have been easier. You know, one of the things about us, oh, I'm just going to talk to us. Word of faith, strong word. Oh, you're, a good, you're a good word, church. You, you know the word. Do you love the word? Do you love the word? I love the word. But there's something about us. Sometimes when it gets tough, God never promised you that everything in life was always going to be easy. I know you all didn't like that. You all just went quiet. I need you to help me. What, what am I saying? Well, you know, even during the hard times, God will get you out of it. But even sometimes right in the middle of the will of God, things can get a little hard. Because see, with us today, if it ain't easy, we don't want to do it. If everybody's not uh, kind and do, you know, if they don't go to the restaurants I want to go to, or they don't want to do what I want to do, or watch what I want to watch, or, or, or root for who I want to root for, we'll just get rid of them. They don't think like me. We just don't have to tolerate them anymore. But you see, life takes work. If you're married, you better believe it takes work. Because Rhonda's always right, but I rarely am. And so I have to change. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, but, but what is that? The will is involved. The will is involved. Jesus will. I'm taking a little extra time. You can see a lot of people, they get messed up with the sovereignty of God, meaning that a lot, so many people believe, well, God is totally in charge. And if he is totally in charge of the earth right now, he's not doing very good. (laughs) 
someone, ought to, you could even just in the United States right now, you could observe if God is totally in charge and everything is done at his will. This will help some of you. I don't want to be playing about it anymore. The Lord told me to move on. But if you don't understand that things, people do things by their will. And God is not in charge of your will. Let us see Adam and Eve. Let us see Adam and Eve in the garden. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't fail in his garden like they failed in their garden? They're both in a garden. One of them didn't do so good. But what? They chose to disobey God. Jesus chose to obey God. You have a chooser. If you look around and you say, well, this, this, this was God's will. The Bible says it's his will that everyone get born again. Are they? Then the will of God is not always done. And in your life, when you get a, a prophecy, a lot of times, especially a personal prophecy, there's, they're conditional. The, if you listen, the Lord will often say to you, if you'll do this, I'll do this. What is that? That's, you, that's your chooser being involved. That's your chooser. So if you don't realize you got, so you can't have it both ways. Well, God's in charge of this, but he's not in charge of your life. Because if he's in charge, of, if he was in charge of every Christian, uh, everybody would be a tither. If he was in charge of every Christian, everyone would walk in love. If he was in charge of you totally all the time and you had no choice but to obey him, we'd all, what's the worship team got on today? We'd all have burgundy and black on today because that, that's the color Gail decided on. And we'd just all obey. Are you with me? You would have all had, um, you know, uh, scrambled eggs this morning. You know, you got to understand that your life is full of choices. But your will has everything to do with your success in life. And now how many of you Christians, you strong, spirit-filled believers in the room, how many of you have quit making mistakes? You don't, you, you don't make them anymore. How many of you, you over the last month, you've, you've no wrong choices? No wrong word. So you see, the fact of the matter is, even if we get everybody saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost, we still got our will to contend with. And the choices we make are not always because we yielded to God. We could have yielded to something else. But Jesus said, and so Jesus is our example. He said, Father, not my will. But your will be done. Let's all say it together again. Y'all with me? Say, Father God, not my will, but your will be done in my life. So all Jesus' life, this moment was this grand deciding moment when all of mankind is in the balance. When he could have called 10,000 angels. He had trained his flesh. Jesus had flesh. He was all God, all man. You got to get that because um, if you don't understand that, then your theology doesn't work because he had to die. He had to, as a man, he had to take our sin. He had to take our sickness and disease. He became poor. He became something so we could become something. He redeemed us. And he showed us in doing that how to deal with every part of us. We know we're supposed to keep our spirit man strong. We know we're supposed to keep our body under. But this middle part of us, this soul, this alma, this, this middle part of you with your mind, your will, and your emotions, you need to get your emotions healed. You need to get your mind renewed. But this will part of you is something that every single day of your life you deal with. And with that will, with that chooser, you can make right choices or wrong choices. And you can't blame it on God. You can't blame it on anybody around you. Adam tried. Adam tried. Well, God, it was the woman you gave me. It was the woman's fault, but you gave, it to, you gave her to me. So it's all your fault. So when it, you got to, are you ready to take some responsibility this morning? Y'all good? Yeah. I wish out Jesus is Lord. 
I'm, I'm showing you how to do this because we're coming into a time and now is that we who are born again, spirit filled, who love God, who make Jesus the Lord of our life. They, this, you've got to have this. Jesus has got to be Lord. Jesus has got to be the center. Our, our affections have to be on him. All eyes on Jesus right now. Hallelujah. So Jesus did this his whole life. Let me run through some scripture. John chapter 4, verse 34. John chapter 4, verse 34. Jesus said unto them, my meat, or what sustains me, is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. So what sustained Jesus? It was doing the will of the Father. John chapter 5, verse number 30. John chapter 5, verse 30. He said, I can of myself do nothing. What? Jesus, he said, I can't do anything on my own. As I hear, I judge. And the reason my judgment is just is because I don't seek my own will. What does that mean? I have a will. Jesus had a will. But the will of the Father, I don't seek my own will, but I seek what? I seek the will of the Father who sent me. So then let's look at this. John chapter 6, verse 38. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will. What does that mean? I got one. Not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. So Jesus, as he was growing up, he had to make a decision that I've not come. He realized I got a will. I can do what I want. But he had to make a decision, like you and I have to make a decision, that we're not going to do our own will. We're going to do the will of the Father. I'm going to do the will of the Father. Everybody say it again. Not my will, but Father God, your will for my life be done. Amen. Amen. All right. So, so can you see that Jesus had a will? Can you see that he had to submit his will? Can you see he had choices? He had choices to make. And because he's Jesus, because he's the son of God, he had, he, he decided to do what the father wanted. Because see, if this doesn't compute to you, th th this is the deal. Sometimes we think we don't have a choice. But you've always got a choice. In every situation, in every circumstance. Some of you are too young. But you remember when Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it? I mean, just tell you plainly, the devil can't make you do nothing. He just can't. Well, everybody said, well, who's everybody? Do you know the majority isn't right? Ask, ask, let's ask Joshua and Caleb. The only thing that's right is God and his word. And you have the ability to choose it all day. And when you and I choose it, again, I'm, not t I'm talking to people who are human like I am. I'm not saying that we all do it perfectly, but how many you know we need to grow into the fullness that God has for us? And we can do it. How, how many would agree with me that when we choose God's way, it's better than anything else? So how do we get there? Well, Psalms 143.10. How do you and I get there? Uh, this is the psalmist's prayer, and I think it should be our prayer. Lord, teach me to do your will. So you can be taught by God how you know the Holy Ghost is the teacher. He can, what is the will of God? Well, the will of God is the word of God. Everything you need has been written down for you. Every thought that God has that you needed has been written down. Every way, the way God does stuff is written down. His, his ways are higher than your ways. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. But he has revealed them to us, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, by the Holy Ghost. So you can know the thoughts and you can know the ways of God. But what you and I have to be, because we have a will, we have to be teachable. Lord, teach me your will. Lord, teach me your will. And that tells me again, it's not automatic. Your spirit's born again. It's alive unto God. As soon as you believe that Jesus is raised from the dead and you confess that, your spirit's born again. So your spirit, Jesus said, is willing, but your flesh is weak. So since my flesh is weak, then I got to do something with the middle of me because I got to keep my flesh under control. Because my flesh will make decisions based on how it feels, based on the crowd, based on what feels good, based on what's easy. 
Easy is not always God. Well, Lord, if it's easy, I'll do it. Well, he, get yoked up with him, it's light and easy, but doesn't mean that um, you won't go through some challenging situations. What it does mean, you'll always come out on the other side victorious. You can't judge if you're in, I'm getting off here a little bit, but let me just say this. You cannot judge if you're in the will of God by going, is it easy? The will of God is not discerned by outward things. Well, if I'm supposed to move, I'm going to put my house on the market. And if it sells within a week, I'll know it's the will of God. You live in, in this area, it's going to sell in a day. You cannot base that off of an outward circumstance. Are you with me? It's important. Let's say it again. Say, teach me, Lord. Your will. Psalms 40, verse 8. Then this, you got to get this way. I delight. I'm flat happy about. I get excited about. Ooh, I get a thrill to do your will, oh God. In other words, you've got to get happy about it. You've got to decide his, his ways are better than your ways. You've got to decide God is smarter than you are. And you got to be open to be taught. And then number two, you got to delight in it. In other words, I think that means you give your full attention to it, but you're happy about it. You're excited about it. Um, One of the things, so with your will, I keep calling it, but it's what it is. It's your chooser. Um, The Bible is really clear about some things that really from even the old covenant. I want to, I want to show you this. Um, Joshua 24, 15. Joshua 24, 15. So this is our part. My part is I'm going to ask the Lord to teach me. I'm going to delight to do his will. And then I've got to realize something. And this is really what I, I need you to understand this. You have to choose. To not to choose is to choose. When you don't choose something, you're going to let somebody else choose for you. Now, there are some things when it comes even like to our things here. Sometimes, um, like, uh, well, just, this only, exactly, you know, um, our government is run by choice of the majority of the people. Well, I just believe God can sovereignly come in. You'd be wrong. Well, I just believe God's in control. You'd be wrong. Because if you don't get this, you're going to live through life frustrated. Jesus prayed a prayer. He said, Father, your will be done on, that means it's not, as it is in heaven. How many of you know the kingdom government up there is smooth? There's no turnover because there doesn't need to be. Everybody's good. Everybody's got a mansion up there. There's a king. It's peaceful. All is well. So heaven, how many know God doesn't have two wills? He doesn't have separate wills for earth and heaven. He doesn't change when it comes to earth. If if it was already just going to happen the way God wanted it, Jesus wouldn't have prayed. Now, you can't control the whole of the earth. But Jesus called the devil the prince of the power of the air. Paul called him the God, little g, of this world. Now, wouldn't it make sense that somebody might be in charge down here who don't know what they're doing? Or is, they do know what they're doing. They always like to cause a mess and chaos. It's chaotic down here. Well, that's because Satan legally is in charge because Adam handed it over. But once you get born again, you're supposed to be part of another kingdom. You're now an ambassador down here in a mess. But where you're from, there's peace. 
Where you're from, everything works. Your citizenship, your first loyalty is to heaven. You and I are sojourning. We're, we're traveling through this land to do our best to make it better. But the will of God is not always done on the earth. Because you can't even tell me that you 100% do the will of God. It would it help you to realize that, well, Lord, why don't you just? I don't understand why you don't. How come you didn't do this? Because he's not in charge and people make choices. And when they make a choice, he can't override it. Well, yes, he can. He's God. No, he can't. Because if he did, then this would all be rigged and there would be no choice and he would be choosing who got to go to heaven and who didn't. Now it's our choice. It's our choice. You and I have chosen. But that's why the Lord was so strong. Joshua 24, 15. It says, and if it, and if it be evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day who you're going to serve. Y'all chosen? I know you did. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. As for me and my house, what is that? That's a choice. That's a choice. And that's something you have to choose. Now, you all know this one, but we look at it a lot around here. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Man, this would just help so many people. I wish they would listen because they quit being so frustrated with God. The devil aims to make people frustrated with God because where are you? What are you doing? But you see, if you understand how the psalmist said, the heavens belongs to the earth, to, the heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth has he given to the sons of men. The sons of men mess it up. But see, you and I have come with the light of the gospel, and we can turn it uh, right side up. When the righteous are seated, there's peace in a city. But that doesn't mean just in government. That just means when the church realizes who they are. Hallelujah. Deuteronomy 30, 19. I call heaven and earth. There was a big old meeting. I call heaven and earth to record this day. So there was a day God said this, that I have set before you life and death. So what is that? Blessing and cursing. It's a choice. It's a choice. Everybody say, it's a choice. It was a choice to get born again. It was a choice to get filled with the Holy Ghost. I'll just be real bold. It's a choice to get healed. It's a choice to prosper. It's a choice to walk in peace. It's a choice to do things God's way. It's a choice to make Jesus Lord. It's a choice what you do in every, it's a choice where you work. It's a choice who you marry. It's a choice how many children you got. It's a choice, it's a choice, it's a choice, it's a choice, it's a choice. And if that choice is taken away from us, then, 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 then the word of God as it's written, who God has shown us, then doesn't work. Because if you believe in any area that God takes away your choice, and in that area he's sovereign, then it messes with the entire word of God, and it messes. Because, see, a lot of people do believe, well, whatever happens, you know, come on, after the Olympics, someone's going to get a silver, and they're going to say, well, I just believe whatever's meant to be. Que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. Well, I just believe it's just meant to be. No, he's better. <laughs> he practiced harder. His genetics, his, you, know, you know, whatever. That coach was better. That play was stupid. It didn't work. You understand? He went for two points and he shouldn't have. What was he thinking? You know what I'm saying? It's a choice. Well, I just believe God picks. Well, you, you believe wrong. Why are you being so bold, Pastor Mark? Because see, if you believe wrong, it's going to affect your life. Because then when something bad happens, you believe, well, I don't know what the purpose is, but I'm sure God's got a reason. 
No, the devil's the one who steals, kills, and destroys. And we can choose not to participate. I call heaven and earth record against you this day. That I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose. Y'all choosing? But how many know you don't just choose once? You choose every day. That both you and your seed, your choices affect your children and your grandchildren. Don't got time for that, but I'm telling you, your choices affect your, don't just affect you. That you may love, that thou may love the Lord your God, and you may obey his voice, and that may cleave unto him, for he is the, your life, and the length of, uh, and the length of days thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to Abraham. I just want you to see, so um, there's a choice, and then all the stuff that went with it. All right, let's, let's move on. Because I want to do this. Um, uh, one of the things, that, so this, our part is what? Number one, Lord, teach me your word. Number two, I want to delight to do your will. Number three, I realize I got to choose. If I don't choose, then I've made a choice. I mean, you know, if you don't choose Jesus, then you don't choose God the Father as your father. And then the devil will be your father. There's two fathers. Either Father God or, or you're, you're, Jesus said it, you're of your father, the devil. There's just two. There's just two. That's an, e that's an easy choice. So when someone chooses to reject Jesus, they've rejected the father. Being born again is a choice. Getting filled with the Holy Ghost is a choice. It's a choice. It's a choice. So what am I telling you? Um, we have to choose. Now, what will help you choose? Everybody good? You still good? It's still good? Why are you so passionate about this, Pastor Mark? Because I, I, I've done this for so long, and I've watched people, and I agonize for people, that they wander through their life, and they don't realize that their choices, the influences they have in their life, who they listen to, what they listen to, affects them in such a way. Because, see, any input you get determines what choices you make. How many of you, uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. He's like, please listen to me. That's what beseech means. Please listen to me, brethren, by the mercies of God. I don't, he's begging people. By the mercies of God. I mean, he's invoking everything he knows. That you do what? That you present your body a living sacrifice. Can you get this? Woo. <laughs> Hold on a second. I beseech you, therefore, brother. I wore something lively to encourage you today. <laughs> I, something happy. <clears throat> I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. That this, now, this is, he's begging. And, and I think the Holy Ghost is telling us the same thing. Number one, you got to present your body a living sacrifice. Your flesh wants to be in charge. And you got to crucify it. And the best way to crucify it is every day offer it to God. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world. In other words, the devil through the world, through all kinds of stuff, is trying to conform you to it. And if you don't recognize that there is a massive, uh, you know, the devil has plans to conform. If you get out of line, he's made those that he's their father very vocal. They're trying to conform you and shut you up. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. So that means we've got to go through the metamorphosis process. It's not automatic. The caterpillar has got to become the butterfly. The tadpole has got to become the frog. It is a process. You become something totally different. That's what that word transform is, metamorpho. By the, how? By doing the 60-day challenge at the minimum. And you got to get in there and study the word. You got to do more and read it. You got to study it. By the renewing of your mind that you may, uh-oh, prove. 
So this tells me that people do not walk in the will of God because they don't do these two things. They don't, off, they don't keep their body under. They don't offer it a living sacrifice. That they don't transform their mind with the renewing of the word of God. The word of God's like water. You got to wash it. You got to wash your mind. You got to retrain yourself. Uh, and then it says that you may prove what is the, and I know people misinterpret this and you've been around long enough or maybe you haven't, but this is not three different wills of God. This is a description of what it is to be in the will of God. It's good. It's acceptable. It's perfect. So there's not a, a good will of God, an acceptable will of God, or a perfect will of God. You either in, you out. You either in, you out. Um, if you mess up, you say, well, I'm going to do plan D. There is no plan D. It's back to plan A. I don't know how God does it. He just does it. God has a plan for your life. But how do you prove it? That what is the good, acceptable, perfect will of God? You've got to renew your mind. What, what is that? So that you can make the choices that God wants you to make. It's very difficult to make appropriate and proper choices if your body gets to do whatever it wants, whenever it wants to do it. It's very hard for you to make proper choices when your mind, godly choices, if your mind is not renewed with the word of God. You'll think some squirrely stuff and you'll say some squirrely stuff, which will cause you to do some squirrely stuff. You'll allow the God of this world to blind your eyes with, because he's trying to conform you to his way of thinking, his way of doing. It's an onslaught. It's everywhere. And so we're not going to be conformed. We're going to be transformed. Amen. So can you see that? We know in James it says what? Be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. How, how do I make Jesus the Lord of my life? Father, not my will, but your will be done. Just like Jesus had a will, you've got a will, and now how do you make your will line up with his will? How do you and I submit ourselves fully and completely unto God so that we can walk in the will of God and know the will of God? So we, what do we got to do? We got to, Lord, teach me. I delight to do your will. It's got to be, uh, it's got to be, you got, you got to really want to do it. I, you got to understand, I got to choose right. My chooser has to choose God. I choose wh who I'm going to serve. I choose what I'm going to think on. I choose what I'm going to watch. I choose who I'm going to listen to. I choose what's going to go into me. I choose it. And if you choose incorrectly, then what's it going to do? It's going to mess with your mind, with your soul, and it's going to mess with your chooser. Then you're going to end up making bad choices, bad decisions, because you've had bad input. Because the God of this world is trying to conform you so that even if you're born again and going to go to heaven when you die, that here on the earth, he, by making bad choices, you open yourself up to the thief. And so we can shut him down. How do we shut him down? By making right choices. Are, are you good? <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, how can we tell how we're doing? You ready for some inventory? Pray, everybody say, Jesus is Lord. <laughs> Jesus is Lord. I know we're not running around the room, but you get this, you'll run later. You'll swing from the chandelier. Oh, we don't have any chandeliers. You'll, you'll, you'll swing. I mean, you, it'll be ha because, because this is so important right now. And honestly, I was done, and the Holy Ghost said to me what, about Jesus being in the garden, uh, not my will, but your will be done. Make Jesus the Lord of your life. And so when we do this, and it's an ongoing thing, it's not like we arrive at perfection and then we can quit. No matter who you are, no, long, no matter how long you've served God, if it's 60 years or one day, you got to make up your mind every day. I'm going to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I'm going to do it by, by having this attitude. I'm going to work in this space, not my will, but your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. How can we tell if we're doing that? John 7, 17. Oh, I want people to get this. John 7, 17 says, if any man will do his will. So it's John 7, 17, not 17, 7. John 17, John 7, 17. If any man do his will, so are you doing his will? Well, so that means you're doing his word. That means you're making proper choices. Watch this. He shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God 
or whether I speak of myself. Now watch. You can expand that a little bit because doctrine, we think of just the word of God and doctrine. If you really are a disciple, if you really, Jesus is really the Lord of your life. If you really um, have made your will his will, like Jesus, then when something comes up, you're going to know whether it's of God or not. It's just kind of an automatic knowing because you're, you're, you've submitted yourself fully unto him. He is the Lord of your life. And so it's very easy to discern, is this of God or is this not of God? And unfortunately, in the body of Christ today, because of what I see going on, I know that a lot of people are not making Jesus Lord. A lot of people are not uh, making proper choices. Their will is not God's will because there's too much confusion in the body for this to be true. Um, somebody's got to be right and somebody's got to be wrong. How many of you know God's not got schizophrenia? And I don't mean that, I don't mean that negatively. I, I don't mean that to make fun of. But I mean, he's not got multiple personalities. He's not um, one group of people he's not saying one thing to. And another group of people he's not he's saying another. All God. And it contradicts. No. Well, I'm right. Well, every man's ways are right in his own mind. You're wrong. Let God be true. This also means there's some liars. Deception. Deceived. We gotta live in this time, man. The devil, this there's an onslaught. He knows his time is short. And he is going nuts. I don't care how nuts he goes, I won't be there standing there saying, Is that the one? Throw him in. Hallelujah. If any man do the will of God, everybody say, I'm going to do the will of God. Then what? You're going to know the doctrine. You're going to know whether it's of God or someone's just speaking for themselves. You're going to know. You're going to know. Romans 6, 16. Let's look at this one in the New Living. I like this. Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever or whoever, depends on what translation, you choose to obey. You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Whoever you're listening to, obeying, and therefore submitting to, whether you like it or not, you're either a slave to Jesus or you're a slave to something else. So says the word of God. If you don't like that language, don't take it up with me. Take it up with headquarters. And because he wanted you to make it this stark, this, this, this direct, this kind of abrasive even. Whatever, whoever you're listening to, whoever you choose to obey, whatever direction you're going, you have become a slave to that. Um, you can be a slave to sin. How many are glad we don't have to be? Does anybody remember being a slave to sin? Which leads to death. But, thank God, I would say but. Come on. Jesus is the Lord of my life. Not my will, but his will be done. Maybe I haven't done it perfect, but I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep obeying. I'm going to keep putting my body under. I'm going to keep renewing my mind. I, I'm going I'm to keep saying, not my will, but your will be done. I'm going to go to the garden as many times as i got to go. Amen? Come on, there's a prayer that most people don't pray anymore. It's called the prayer of consecration. That's, that is Jesus' prayer. Not my will, but your will be done. I choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Glory to God. Um, can you take one more? How can I tell if Jesus is my Lord, if not my will, but his will is what I, I'm, I'm aiming for in my life? Let's look at James chapter 4. Uh, we're going to start at verse 13 now, the Amplified Classic. Now, you've heard this. Uh, if you've been around here, you've heard me uh, 
you know, teach this scripture. Now, uh, if you're new, you probably heard this, teach, this scripture uh, taught at funerals or given at a funeral uh, because basically they use this, uh, you know, you don't know when it's your time because um, God says uh, if you'll live, you'll live, and if you die, you die. But we know that that's not what this scripture says, so, so let's look at it. Come you now, you who say today or tomorrow, We'll go into such a city and spend a year there and carry on our business and make money. So who's he talking to? James is talking to spirit. He's talking to believers. And there's a believer. What am I talking about? A believer is about to make a decision, a choice. He's going to choose something. Just like some of you chose your career. Choose where you work. Sometimes God will say, do whatever you want to do. Sometimes he'll have something specific. You just got to know. Um, What you do not know, the least thing about is what may happen tomorrow. What is the nature of your life? You are really but a wisp, isn't that encouraging? A vapor, a puff of smoke, a mist that is visible for a little while and then disappears. Hold it right there. Listen, if you lived 120 years in the scheme of eternity, what is that? It's a wisp. When God calls us his little children, that is not an exaggeration. We are mere toddlers when it comes to the mind and the thoughts of God. So he's like, you say you're going to go to this city and you're going to do your business there. And then the Holy Ghost is coming back through James and saying, but you don't even know what your life holds tomorrow. Verse 15, you ought to instead say, if the Lord is willing, what is this? This is you submitting your will to God. I'm going to check in with the Lord, with the master, to see what he wants me to do. I'm not going to assume. I'm not going to take for granted. I'm not going to do my thing, which is where a lot of believers are. I'm going to do my thing and ask him to bless it. He is not required to bless your thing. The covenant don't work that way. Well, Lord, here's my thing. You said you'd bless the works of my hand. But if he didn't tell you to do that, then he's not obligated to bless it. You ought to say and said, if the Lord is willing. We shall live and we shall do this or that. It doesn't say live or die. This is not talking about dying. It's talking about where you live and what work you're doing. Verse 16. But as it is, you boast falsely in your presumption and your self-conceit. In other words, I'm just going to go where I want to do. I want to do what I want to do and it'll just be fine. Well, you don't know that. You don't know that. What you do know is Jesus knows everything. What you do know is he knows tomorrow and he can show you tomorrow. What you do know is that he cares for you and he's got plans for you and that's what he's going to bless. Do you remember in the Old Testament, Elijah, when there was a famine on, the Holy Ghost told him to go to the brook Cherith. You remember that? He didn't tell him to go to the Tennessee River. He didn't tell him to go to his favorite spot. He told him to go to a specific place. And at that specific place, the ravens fed him bread and meat. I believe it came from the king's table, but I don't know where it came from. It just came. How many of you know if Joseph, if Elijah would have went to the Tennessee River, somebody at the, that brook would have got some bread and some meat. There would have been no delivery at the Tennessee River. You see, when, we're, when it's not working, the first thing is we're like... God, where are you? But his question would be, where where did I tell you to be? When Jesus is Lord, you let go of your options. When Jesus is master, you do what he says. And when you do what he says, you're just going to flat be happy. It's good because he's smarter than you. Verse 17, to finish up. So if any person who knows what is right to do but doesn't do it, to him it's sin. Another reason we know that we're walking as Jesus Lord, where not our will, but his will is being done. The Bible says in James 4, 
17, submit yourself therefore unto God. James 4, 7. Submit yourself therefore unto God and do what? One of the first places I always check, if the devil ain't moving, then maybe I have moved out of something. So I always check my, that submission is Jesus is Lord. Submission is not my will, but your will be done. When the Lord tells you to do something, you don't want to do it. What do you got to do? Submit. Submission never happens until you disagree. So the Lord could ask you to do something. It could be as simple as going, you know, I mean, it just could be as simple as as anything. Go that, it just, I don't don't have time to get into it, but because I could get down five, six holes here and and we could be here another two hours. Uh, But you understand what I'm saying? So a lot of times when the devil's not moving, the first thing I ask myself, am I submitted? Because if I'm submitted to God, the devil has to move. He doesn't have a choice. If Jesus is my Lord, if, it's not, if I'm doing his will, not my will, right? It, so, so every area of your life, you don't have a sacred life and a secular life. You've got one life. So you got to include Jesus, the Lord, the master into your business, into your career, into your family, into everything you do.